This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the series Murder in the Family, where I share stories of families who murdered together. Last time, I shared a case about a band of murderous brothers. It's only fair I give the females equal time. So this time, I will detail a particularly shocking case of serial killer sisters. Not only are female serial killers rare, but for sisters to kill together is almost unheard of. And these sisters had so many victims that they even made it into the Guinness Book of World Records. This is Chapter 2, The Gonzalez Sisters. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Learning, now featuring lynda.com content the leader in online learning for the past 20 years. LinkedIn Learning is for problem solvers, for go-getters, and for people who want to make moves in their career. Whether you run your own business, freelance, or just have a side hustle, everything you need to achieve more is on LinkedIn Learning. A successful entrepreneur is constantly learning, and LinkedIn Learning offers courses to strengthen every aspect of your business. From finance and accounting courses, web development and design, and marketing courses that cover everything from AdWords to content marketing and SEO. I don't know about you, but I make to-do lists and then can't remember where I put them. That's because I didn't have a strategy to keep everything on track. I've been watching the course Managing To-Do Lists, and it has helped me immensely. It outlines several strategies for keeping track of your most important items and checking them off your list every day. Then I can pick one or two strategies that speak to the way I like to work, whether that is by writing things down on paper, creating a digital list, or using software. I found tools that help me stay on track. With a LinkedIn Learning membership, you can quickly find the right video course for your needs, be taught by industry experts, and learn at your own pace and using the method you prefer. And LinkedIn Learning courses are available worldwide. My listeners can get a 30-day trial with LinkedIn Learning today by visiting linkedin.com slash once. That's linkedin.com slash once, all lowercase for a free 30-day trial. And thank you for supporting the show. Four daughters were born to Isidro Torres Gonzalez and Bernadina Valenzuela in Al Salto, Jalisco, Mexico. Their mother was a very pious Catholic and raised her daughters under her own strict version of church doctrine. Isidro, their father, was a violent alcoholic. He lived under a code of machismo, where the man is always in charge and women were considered property. He strictly controlled both his wife and his daughters. He believed that, given any freedom, women would become whores, and this, he was determined, would not happen to his daughters. In order to keep this from happening, he kept his daughters under his thumb, monitoring their behavior and dress. If they wore makeup or clothing he determined to be too revealing, he would punish or beat them. When they complained to their mother— She simply told them to pray and ask God to forgive them for their sins. They were unable to live a normal life, like most girls and young women could. The family was also very poor. Most accounts I found describe Isidro as a rural police officer or a member of Los Rurales, the celebrated federal police force that patrolled the countryside to keep law and order in the more rural areas of Mexico. These officers were modeled after the Texas Rangers in the U.S., and wore the traditional uniform of the charro, or Mexican cowboy, bolero jackets and tight trousers with silver braiding and buttons and wide sombreros. They cut a romantic and impressive figure and were often featured in ceremonies and parades. They've been described as the world's most picturesque police force. However, this was not the police force that Isidro was a member of. The federal rurales were largely disbanded with the overthrow of President Porfirio Diaz in 1911, although some detachments continued on to fight alongside the federal army during the Mexican Revolution. Isidro Gonzalez was most likely a part of the rural defense force that began in the 1920s to quell uprisings among the farmers. Wealthy landowners in the countryside began to hire private armies to keep federal laws and officers off of their property. In response, the Mexican army armed and backed rural peasants into small defense units operating under their jurisdiction. They were paid a very small wage. All members of the rural defense force were required to be peasant farm workers hired by collective farms. 
This didn't change until the 1950s. These men, then, were already poor and were willing to be included as part of the rural police force, probably to collect a few pesos more per month, but more importantly, perhaps, to feel as if they had a sense of power and control. For some men, like Isidro Gonzalez, this power would go to their heads. By the time the four girls were young women, the family had moved from Jalisco to the small village of San Francisco del Rincón in the neighboring state of Guanajuato. The village was called San Pancho for short by the locals. Gonzalez rode on horseback around town at night as part of the rural police force. He acted arrogantly and didn't shy away from abusing citizens verbally or even physically when on patrol, especially since he was often drunk. But the ones he saved most of his abuse for was his family. As his daughters came of age and sought to meet men to marry, the main purpose, I would imagine, was to get out from under their father's thumb, he became even more controlling. He began locking his daughters up in the town jail whenever they displeased him. The oldest daughter, Carmen, began secretly seeing an older man named Luis Caso. They were able to run away together and plan to be married. When her father discovered this, he was furious. He hunted her down, found her, and dragged her back to town, beating and berating her the whole way. When they arrived, he locked her in the jail for her indecent behavior. A few hours later, Gonzalez and two other officers were ordered by the municipal president to look for a wealthy rancher named Felix Ornelas. Ornelas was refusing to comply with the state laws, and the president wanted him brought in. When he was found, Ornelas balked at being taken in by the officers. When he would not comply, Gonzalez shot and killed him. Of course, this was not allowed, and Gonzalez went on the lam, hiding out in Jalisco as a fugitive. But in his rush out of town, he didn't consider that his daughter Carmen was locked away in jail. Without her father around to release her, and with no way of securing bail, she remained in jail for 14 months. A local grocer finally took pity on her and paid for her release, promising the authorities that he would marry her and provide for her. Meanwhile, with their father away, the girls tried their best to live a normal life. Delfina, the second oldest, began an affair with an older man, as had her sister Carmen before her. When her father returned from hiding and discovered his 20-year-old daughter had a boyfriend, he became so enraged, he struck her hard enough to almost kill her. Reports say she was struck on the nape of the neck, which makes it sound like he gave her a karate chop. I'm not really sure what that means. But in any case, she went down and almost died, according to witnesses. She recovered and once again was left under the control of her father, as were her two younger sisters, Maria de Jesus and Maria Luisa. Have you ever really considered how much time you spend each week deciding on what to make for dinner, making a grocery list, and shopping for food? Well, I have. You'll be amazed. It takes a minimum of two and a half to three hours per week. I don't know about you, but I'd rather spend that time watching a great movie, reading a book, or taking a nap. And I get so sick of cooking the same old thing, don't you? Well, have I got a brilliant idea for you. You need to try HelloFresh and avoid all the time, hassle and boredom, and let them take care of all the details while you just enjoy a delicious meal. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. All the fresh and tasty ingredients come pre-measured in handy labeled meal kits so you know which ingredients go with which recipes. And these great tasting meals can be prepared in about 30 minutes. It's great for families on the go. These quick and easy meals are so yummy, they're sure to please even your pickiest eaters. I was so excited when I got my first delivery from HelloFresh. It had three meals included. I got adobo loco steak with poblano, corn, and crispy potato hash. That sounds fancy, but it is a super tasty steak and potato dish, a staple in my house. Thai spiced pork meatballs with yakisoba noodles, and Carolina barbecue chicken with mac and cheese and green beans. Not only were all the meals delicious, they were also made in less than an hour, and most of the recipes are created so you just use one or two pots or pans to cook in, saving time on cleanup as well. Well, I loved all of them, and it's hard to pick my favorite, but the adobo loco steak was pretty darn good. I'll definitely make that again. You can see a photo of how beautiful these meals look, even when I cook, on my Instagram page. If all this sounds great to you, and I'm sure it does, I've got a deal for you. As a listener of Once Upon a Crime, you can get $30 off your first week of meal kit delivery 
by going to HelloFresh.com and using my offer code once upon a crime 30. That's HelloFresh.com and use offer code once upon a crime 30 to get $30 off your first week. And remember, when you support our sponsors, you support this podcast. Thanks. In the mid 1930s, Carmen Delfina and Maria de Jesus, called Chewy, Chewy is a nickname for Jesus. I don't know why, it just is. That's your 10 second Latino lesson for today got jobs working in a yarn and fabric factory. It seems that their father was allowing them more freedom now, and I'm not sure what changed. Perhaps he was no longer able to work, or couldn't get employment, and so needed his daughters to bring in an income. Or perhaps he died. Reports are sketchy. Whatever the reason, the Gonzalez sisters from here on out would seem to be free to do any number of things that their father would have previously forbidden, as we shall soon see. Shortly after they began at the factory, Carmen teamed up with a man named Jesus Vargas, who went by the nickname El Gato, which means the cat. That was an easy one. El Gato was a small-time criminal, and he and Carmen started a small canteen, or one-room general store. They began to make a profit, but El Gato soon put them out of business by dipping too liberally into the cash register. As we'll see, the Gonzalez sisters, having grown up in poverty, would always hustle to make a dollar. They seemed to be afraid of very little, except being poor. Carmen was able to scrounge together the few dollars left from the canteen to open up a saloon. Business was decent, but Delfina especially wanted to increase their profits. One way to do this was to get local law enforcement to relax restrictions on their establishment, like limiting the hours they could serve liquor and less police presence, which would bring in more customers. In exchange, the sisters offered them sexual favors. Soon, however, the sisters began to recruit local girls into prostitution, and the business evolved from a bar into a bordello. But the Gonzalez sisters were not interested in paying wages for their working girls, so they started out by tricking girls into prostitution. Many young girls in Guanajuato and the neighboring states of Michoacán and Jalisco lived in relative poverty, especially those in the rural areas. The sisters would take turns traveling to small villages to offer local girls employment as maids or waitresses. Many girls were happy to take them up on their offer. Once they arrived, hundreds of miles away to an unfamiliar village where they knew no one and were also penniless, they realized what they had gotten themselves into. They were locked into a room and forced into sex slavery. If they did not comply, they did not eat and would be beaten as well. The sisters would procure girls in other ways as well they began placing help-wanted ads in small newspapers. After speaking to the applicant, they would send the girl a one-way ticket to come to San Pancho, where she met the same fate. With the police looking the other way and free labor provided by the girls, profits began to skyrocket, so much so that the Gonzalez sisters began to expand their operations. They opened up more bars slash brothels as far away as Mexico City, Carmen, Delfina, and Chuy operated the business in Guanajuato and Jalisco, while Maria Luisa operated one in San Juan del Rio, near Mexico City. They also purchased a bar in Lagos, Jalisco, from a gay man who was nicknamed El Poquianchi. The nickname was then passed on to the sisters, and they would forever after be collectively known as Las Poquianchis, a name they hated but nevertheless stuck. Delfina now had a lover named Hermenhildo Zuniga, who was known as the Black Eagle. He, along with another man, Estrada, the executioner Bocanegra, does everyone have a nickname? Became the enforcers for the Gonzalez sisters. They began to not just lure the girls away from their homes, but to kidnap them outright and force them to work at the bordellos. The youngest girls would be put to work as sex slaves, and the prettiest of them, who were still virgins, would be saved for customers who would pay top dollar to deflower them. Two of the Gonzalez sisters' most popular bars were the Guadalajara de Noche and Barca de Oro. Both had a high turnover of girls. The women were, of course, treated poorly by the Gonzalez sisters. They would be raped by the Gonzalez's henchmen, as well as Delfina's son, Ramon Torres, called El Tepo. They were given very little to eat and were forced to purchase clothes, makeup, and other supplies from the Gonzalez sisters at high prices. In this way, they kept the women and girls dependent on them. Not that they'd let them leave anyway. Many of the girls were locked inside night and day and never saw daylight. They were also forced to take drugs, 
cocaine, and even heroin, to keep them compliant. When a girl became ill, tried to run away, or refused to work, the sisters worked out a way to deal with them. First, they would lock them in a room to starve, and many perished due to lack of food and water. Some died due to untreated illnesses. When girls became pregnant, which happened frequently, of course, they were given forced abortions, and many died due to infections or from bleeding to death. The Gonzalez sisters could care less. They just kidnapped more girls to take their place. Some girls were murdered simply because they no longer pleased the customers. Many who had arrived young, beautiful, and healthy later became ill, painfully thin due to lack of food, and very weak. You might wonder why didn't anyone see what was going on and report it to the authorities. The Gonzalez sisters' clients included local law enforcement, government officials, soldiers, and businessmen. Some of the most powerful clients were given special favors by the sisters, and the youngest and prettiest girls set aside for them. When girls became sick or were dying because of botched abortions or other conditions, they were taken to the Gonzalez's ranch in San Angel by the Black Eagle. They were starved to death or outright murdered, their bodies buried in a field on the property. Some would later report that the ranch resembled a concentration camp with boarded-up windows in the outbuildings where the girls were most likely kept, and razor wire encircling the property. However, the women were not the Gonzalez sisters' only victims. Some of the male customers foolishly flashed too much cash now and then. When this happened, they would also be murdered, their cash stolen, and their bodies buried in the mass graves along with the women. The girls were also forced to steal from their clients and were beaten if they refused or didn't steal enough. They also enlisted the women to kill each other. When the sisters determined to get rid of one of the women, they would force the others to participate in beating her to death with their fists, feet, or by using sticks and heavy logs. Delfina's son, El Tepo, took after his mother in his greed and violent ways. Playing cards one evening with some of the local cops, El Tepo, seeing that he was beginning to lose hand after hand, began to cheat. When he was caught, a fight broke out between him and the cops. In the scuffle, El Tepo was shot and killed. The police then closed down the bar. Delfina swore revenge for the killing of her son and ordered her boyfriend, the Black Eagle, to track down the officers and kill them. He complied. But dead officers apparently didn't warrant much of an investigation. It wasn't uncommon for the police to be on the take and involved in criminal activity themselves, so there could be any number of reasons for a cop to come up dead or missing, it seems. The Gonzalez sisters continued in their murderous ways, kidnapping, enslaving, beating, and killing scores of women without consequence. And they continued to prosper financially as well. Things might have continued on as they had for almost 15 years, until one day in January 1964. One of the girls who had been imprisoned at the ranch in San Angel, named Catalina Ortega, managed to escape through a small opening in a wall. The sisters' henchmen searched for Catalina, but were unable to find her. She was able to flee to safety and contact her mother. Together, they went to the Leon Guanajuato Police Department to file a complaint. Luckily, these police officers were not cronies of the Gonzaleses. After hearing the girl's story, they secured an arrest warrant for both Delfina and Chewy and a search warrant for the ranch. On January 14, 1964, they raided the ranch at San Angel. What they found was shocking and became big news that brought reporters and citizens flocking to the village. The officers first found a number of young girls between the ages of 13 and 17 living in squalid conditions and locked away behind the walls of the rancho. It was obvious that they were being kept against their will and that the things Catalina had told them were true. As they began questioning the other girls, they learned about things too terrible to be believed. Not only had they been forced into sex slavery, abused, raped, and starved, but they told of forced abortions and murders of other girls as well as some clients. They pointed out places on the property where they said the bodies were buried. Delfina and Chewy were arrested and questioned by police. They showed no remorse, and pictures of Delfina especially during this time show her attitude to be defiant, as well as matter-of-fact in her demeanor. When asked what happened to the wealthy men who had come to her brothel and then gone missing, she explained that they had died. 
When asked how, she shrugged and simply said, the food didn't agree with them. In the most famous photo of the Gonzalez sisters, taken by a newspaper reporter, Delfina sits holding a cigarette in her hand. Her fingers are pointing out towards the interviewer, and she is seen almost grinning. Sitting next to her is her sister Chewy, in a relaxed pose, her face leaning against her right hand. They are both dressed all in black, with Chewy's hair covered in a black headscarf. They look like typical pious Catholic women of that era. A relative of the Gonzalez sisters, Josefina Gutierrez, was picked up around the same time for some minor infraction. When they determined that she was related to the suspected murderers, they began to lean on her for any information she might have and threatened to implicate her in her relatives' crimes. It was then that they received the information of how the Gonzalez sisters had lured and kidnapped the girls and imprisoned them. Las Pocianchis, as they were now identified by the media, were brought to the property, as was the Black Eagle. With photographers in tow, the police made them point out where the bodies were buried. Once they did, their enforcer, who had been in charge of burying many of the victims, was now made to dig them up. Angry villagers surrounded this macabre scene, yelling threats and demanding that they be allowed to lynch the murderers. Some of the young girls, who had been imprisoned at the ranch, were brought along to point out the areas where they said other bodies would be found. On that cold day in January, over 91 bodies would be discovered on the Gutierrez sisters' property. Bodies would later be determined to be of young women, men, and fetuses. People came from all over to see the serial killer sisters, many whose loved ones, daughters, sisters, and friends had gone missing and were now believed to be buried on the Gonzalez's property, wanted to see them dead, and as soon as possible. Due to threats, the military was called out to guard the sisters from a possible lynch mob. Officials determined that it was not safe to lock them in the same jail in San Pancho, so they sent them to Irapuato City Jail, 80 kilometers away. Delfina and Maria de Jesus were jailed, but Maria Luisa was still hiding out near Mexico City. Carmen, the oldest, had died from cancer in the 1950s. Fearing she would be found and lynched, Maria Luisa turned herself in to the Mexico City police a week after her sisters were arrested. She was then transferred to the same jail as them. When the trial began, dozens of girls and women took the stand to accuse the Gonzalez sisters of their horrible crimes, including murder, rape, and extortion. They told how the sisters also dabbled in Satanism, even forcing the women to have sex with animals. They told of seeing other women and some male customers murdered by the women and their henchmen. They also detailed the bribes the sisters had provided to local and state authorities. The trial was at times chaotic. As their accusers testified on the stand, the sisters would hurl insults and yell at them, calling them liars and even more insulting names. The accusers would then yell back, and the judge had to continually call for order. The proceedings were over quickly, with each of the three sisters found guilty and sentenced to 40 years in prison. I found a resource that listed at least 19 accomplices of the Gonzalez sisters in their murders. Some were hired kidnappers, some kept the women imprisoned, some were simply called chauffeurs. These accomplices had a variety of duties, including as bodyguards for the sisters, enforcers and muscles to keep the girls in line, drug runners, and were also suspected of participating in some of the murders and disposing of the bodies. I did not find what sentences these accomplices, including the Black Eagle, received. Delfina did not last long in prison once she was sentenced in 1964. She is said to have gone mad, as she was always terrified of being murdered in jail. She could easily be called Mexico's most hated woman at that time. She spent most of her waking hours screaming and ranting and raving in her cell. On October 17, 1968, she was doing just this while some workers were making repairs in her cell. One of them was up on a scaffold and looked down to catch a glimpse at the screaming woman. As he did so, a bucket of cement fell off the scaffold and landed on Delfina's head, killing her. Maria Luisa had served 20 years in prison when she was found dead in her cell on November 19, 1984. The Irapuato jail, where the women had been in prison since their arrest, was a run-down and squalid place. Maria Luisa's body was not found for a day, and by the time she was discovered, 
rats had already begun eating her. Maria de Jesus, or Chewy, it seems, was freed before her 40 years was up. It was not recorded why she was freed or when, but I was able to find a source that reports that after release, she married a man named Antonio Hernandez. Some sources say that they met while she was in prison. It seems that after her release, she lived out her life without incident and died in advanced age sometime in the mid-1990s. In 2002, Construction was underway to build a new housing development near the site of the former Gonzales Ranch at San Angel. As a pit was being dug for the foundation, a mass grave was found with over 20 skeletons. Tests were done on the bones, and it was determined that the bodies were most likely buried in the 1950s to 1960s. These victims were added to the body count of the serial killer Gonzales sisters, bringing their total number of victims to over 110. That same year, the Guinness Book of World Records named the Gonzalez sisters the most prolific murder partnership in the world. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Join me next week for the next chapter of Murder in the Family for a case that may remind you a bit of the Generosa Ammon case. You won't want to miss it. You can support the show on Patreon and get exclusive perks, including merch, early release ad-free episodes, and bonus episodes. Go to patreon.com slash once upon a crime and for as little as $2 a month, get bonus content. Thank you to all of you who have already supported the show on Patreon. It's appreciated more than I can say. Stay tuned at the end of the episode where I will share with you a fun and interesting conversation I had with Scott Reeder, a reporter and the host of the Suspect Convictions podcast. You'll find out all about season two of his podcast and it's a fascinating case. Thanks once again for listening. And until next time, be good to one another. I've been a journalist for 30 years. I've worked all over the country. I've uh, been here about 19 years. I worked about every beat imaginable on a newspaper. Um, I was wanting to try something new, and I was writing a book about a murder case I'd covered as a young reporter. My wife's a veterinarian, and we were driving across Illinois to pick up a puppy. And I'd, I'd never listened to a podcast before. And I said, you know, I keep hearing all this stuff about this thing called cereal. Let's go listen to it. So we were listening to it for several hours. And finally, I just said, looked at my wife and I said, you know, this is really good. But the murder I'm writing about is so much more interesting. So I picked up the phone and called up a friend uh, who worked for the local national public radio affiliate. And I said, hey, could um, we get together and talk and see if we could um, produce a podcast together? And long, make a long story short, before the week was out, they decided a producer to work with me for seven months. We produced the first season of Suspect Convictions and ended up number two in the world on iTunes. So I started looking at a uh, murder case closer to my home, uh, about an hour from where I live. Uh, that happened out of um, Bloomington, Illinois. I, I've been fascinated by the case because there's a lot of evidence that's pointing to this man who was convicted of killing his daughter, having been wrongly convicted. So that's what I was going to ask you. So this is season two. And what I was interested to know is, is that the focus of the podcast or is that going to change every season? The first season was about, there was some question about the guilt or innocence of the the man who was convicted. And is that kind of the focus of the podcast is, is looking at those kinds of cases? Well, you know, it's an interesting question. I get asked that all the time. In fact, back in June, when I was at the um, Crime Con convention in Indianapolis, Nancy Grace walked over to my table and she said, looked at my sign and said, suspect convictions. I hope you're not implying that some of these people out here are innocent. And I kind of laughed. That's kind of her shtick. You know, everybody's guilty. Right. And we were talking, and I said, well, you know, I named it that because I wanted something that was deliberately ambiguous. It could mean that the conviction of the suspect is suspect or called into question. It could mean that the suspect has been convicted. So we're talking about his conviction. Or it could mean somebody involved in the case their personal convictions are suspect. It can be a lot of different things. The uh, first season focused in on cases Stanley Liggins and uh, 
accused of committing a horrible, horrible crime. Uh, he wasn't a good man, but there were some real questions as to whether he was guilty of that crime. And we really looked at that one hard. Then uh, we did a little a short arc over the over the summer. We looked at a murder case I covered in um, Texas when I was a young reporter. A man who got into a daycare center and um, shot two people in front of like thirty screaming kids. There was never any question that he was guilty, but he's going to be released from prison now. I interviewed him in prison. Are you really remorseful? Are you ready to reenter society? And I hunted down the family members of the um, woman that was killed, and one of the, uh, and I talked to the woman who was wounded in the incident, and I talked to a whole lot of different people. And you talk, about, you talk to them about their convictions. You know, is this guy in prison really, truly really remorseful? Or is he not? What has sustained these people who have gone through this horrible loss for the last thirty years? So in that instance, we were looking at the personal convictions of the people. This season, we're looking specifically at the allegation that this man committed a crime and murdered his three-year-old daughter. And there's a lot of evidence pointing against that. So we're really questioning the suspect, the conviction of this man. We call it the conviction a suspect conviction. Going back to the first season, what was really interesting about that is a lot of times when we're listening to a podcast about a crime, it's very black and white. You know, here's the monster. You know, here's what they did. This is the punishment or here's the investigation or whatever that is. Here's the victims. And this one, it was really, like you said, it was ambiguous because it's like you said, this person is was a complicated person. You can't just say he's, he's all bad or he's all good. He wasn't, you know, like I said, not a good person. But did he really do this crime? You could tease out a lot of different kind of themes and kind of um, ideas that people have about crime and criminals. So there was really a lot to it that you could really um, listen with somebody and then just discuss this case and what people are thinking and how they feel about this this case and this person. Um, and then you had a lot of background information, a lot of interviews with the, the victim's family and all you know, people in the community, which was really, I thought, gave it an extra kind of layer of looking at crime and the ripple effect that it creates in a community and in a family. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about here with this next case. So what was it about this case that most intrigues you, the one that you're going to be, that you're starting to cover now this season? I was a single dad who was home alone with his daughter. She's three years old. He woke up in the morning, he called out for his daughter to, to get up and didn't hear anything back from her and walked into her room and found her dead in, in, in her bed. And the police got there, the coroner got there, the firefighters and paramedics got there. And the consensus was this is a natural cause of death. And he comes back to the house that afternoon and he goes into his daughter's bedroom and he looks at the screen on the window and notices the screen has been cut right above the levers, you know, that you can read that you reach in and you unlock the screen from the frame. Somebody had cut the screen right above them. And then he's like, Oh my, how could this be? Somebody has broken into this house. This is, this wasn't a natural cause of death. This was a murder. So he starts repeatedly calling nine one one and say, Get a homicide detective out here. My daughter's been murdered. Finally, they just send out a detective to the scene. And he says, I think the person who broke in suffocated her in her bed. The next day, they, the autopsy results come back. And they, found, and they found that she had been suffocated. The first thing the police do is they arrest the father. Because he had said she thought she'd been suffocated. And basically, the only... Evidence against him is he was home alone with his daughter. He kept calling the police and telling her that they thought she was suffocated, and she was. So they said he must have done it. That's what the theme of the season is, is we're looking at whether this man who's serving 150 years in prison has been falsely convicted. But there's a twist in this case. There's an alternate suspect that wasn't allowed to be brought into trial. But later on, another murder that's committed would point directly to this person and lead to more questions in this case. 
the case is unfolding before us. We're finding out stuff each week. We record a new episode every week. We go out and investigate and interview people. And in real time, we discuss the case. This is my producer, Willis Kern, and myself. What we've uncovered uh, that week, and we evaluate the evidence, and we try to focus in. And it's amazing what we're finding out each week. The audience of suspect convictions is learning the details of the case at the same time we are. So where can listeners find the podcast? The podcast, uh, if you go to suspectconvictions.com, you can link up with uh, the different um, places where we can you can download the podcast. Uh, Suspect Convictions is available on iTunes and, and Stitcher and most of the major platforms for podcasts. Um, you know, I, I would ask people when they go to please subscribe to it, not just to just to download one and listen to it, because I think that you're going to find that as time goes on, it's just a really kind of addicting series to listen to. And you're going to want to keep on getting them as they as they go. One of the things we're doing, I think, is, which is kind of cool, is I talked to um, Barton McNeil, the suspect in the case, and we're going to offer up an opportunity and I've never heard any other podcast that's done this, for our listeners to send in questions they want to ask the, the convicted killer. Questions they have when they about the investigation, about the case, about his thoughts on the case, and have him answer that. We're going to have him on the phone, and he's going to answer these questions that people have. So they can email him a question, and then he'll respond to it. And this is kind of an opportunity for the uh, listeners to be part um, sleuths themselves, you know, like, you know, you ever listen to a podcast and said, well, why didn't they ask yeah. this question? Well, you can do that on mm-hmm. this, on this podcast. You can hear it. Uh, you can subscribe to it. Just go to suspectconvictions.com or iTunes or any of the major platforms for podcasting and just look up suspect convictions. Perfect. That sounds great. Well, thank you very much. I really uh, enjoyed our conversation, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the season of Suspect Convictions because I'm already hooked from the, fir- <laughs> from the first episode. I was already hooked, so I can't wait to see wh- how this unfolds. Can I just add something else here, sure. uh, Esther, to mm-hmm. your, uh, your, for your listeners? Yeah. Isn't Esther fantastic? <laughs> Doesn't she do a just awesome uh, podcast? I just think that the work she does is just absolutely terrific. You know, I, I can't recommend her podcast enough. She just, she's just an A-plus um, worker, and you can just tell the diligence she puts into the work. And her work as a, uh, as a um, counselor, working with uh, people really shines through because she understands individuals' motivations probably better than most folks. So I just think she does an awesome job. Well, thank you, Scott. And I didn't pay him for that, you guys. So (laughs) thanks you very much. I appreciate that. So thank you again. And uh, again, once again, you guys, make sure you subscribe to Suspect Conviction so you don't miss it. And I've already have people on, actually on my Facebook page and Twitter saying, you know, thank you for pointing me to Suspect Convictions because I, I'm loving this podcast. So I, I know that you guys will like it. If you like my show, you'll definitely like Scott's show. It's completely different, but he puts a lot of time and energy into it and does a really good job at getting all of the details in the story, which I know you guys like. So thanks again. Well, thanks. Appreciate it. And I didn't pay her to say that either. So <laughs> okay. thank you. Take care. Okay, thanks. <laughs>